The Good comments on Huawei, we've gotten them from Putin, from the Chinese, from Alphabet, obviously, and today the president. How, how do you synthesize all these points of view? So, Carl, to me, what this is really saying is we're moving from a global economy where we maintain peace and prosperity by having interconnected trading relationships to some increased form of nationalism. And I don't know where we're going to wind up, but I don't see how, from a business point of view, this is anything other than bad news. You know, globalization has been so good for earnings, it's been so good for growth, and obviously good for peace in the world, that to the extent that we stop having open borders for trading, that's just going to have an impact on economic growth. It's going to have an impact, I think, on, you know, just the level of tensions in the world. Roger, Huawei is folded into, or I guess I should say regulations, bans, et cetera, around Huawei here in the U.S. for certain applications is folded into the National Defense Authorization Act. Lawmakers have actually crafted some of these laws around Huawei. Do you, would you expect to see it actually get swept up into the trade talks and for there ultimately to be a positive outcome in terms of the dynamics with that company? I wish I knew. The thing that I find so troubling about all of this is that we basically had a strategy as a country for, what, 30 years, that we were going to have a relationship with China that ensured lowest possible prices on the largest number of goods. So you go to a Walmart, it's like 90 percent products made in China. And we are obviously changing that strategy. The Trump administration is basically going, that is no longer our priority. And there is a legitimate case to be made that the deal with China was not a good deal for us. Their industrial espionage was killing a lot of tech businesses. And at the end of the day, though, I think you have to have a goal. And the thing that really troubles me about all this is I don't see a coherent strategy around this. And for the tech industry, there are obvious benefits if you could find a way to reduce industrial espionage. But at the same time, we need access to China as a market. And so I don't know how we're going to balance all of this. And, you know, my fingers are crossed. But to me, this is a moment in time when, as an investor, you have to be more careful and more cautious about what's going on. You know, Roger, I think about Sheryl Sandberg, the CEO of Facebook, who was on our air not that long ago. And one of the points she made was that while there's all this regulatory and now, you know, antitrust breakup scrutiny of the big tech companies like Facebook here in the U.S., that same type of scrutiny is not taking place on Chinese rivals, thus maybe putting American tech at a disadvantage on the global stage. How do you think about it? I think that's utter nonsense. And here's the way I, I <laughs> handicap it. The Chinese have a very uh, focused strategy in technology, at least domestically. They're really focused on what they call social credit, which is a behavioral manipulation strategy designed to get the entire population doing what the government wants them to do. If you look at Google and you look at Facebook today, they're in a business that Professor Shoshana Zuboff at Harvard describes as surveillance capitalism, where for all intents and purposes, they're doing the same thing that the Chinese are doing, that they are essentially gathering data about everybody, creating these data voodoo dolls, and using that to manipulate the choices available to people to get them to do desired things. Now, it's not a government. They're doing it for commercial purposes. But it, the way I look at this is I don't think we should be competing against China in behavioral manipulation. I would much rather see us spread the opportunities out and do what the United States does really well, which is have millions of different startups doing really amazing things. Right now, you can't do that because Google and Facebook are so dominant that startups just can't go anywhere near them. What would need to happen for those startups to be able to really innovate and really grab a foothold right now? Uh, it's, that's, that is the $64 question. It seems to me that there are two parts of the problem. On the one hand, the way these guys basically take ownership of data, if data cut, comes anywhere near them or if they see it unclaimed, they take possession of it. And as a consequence, they know more about us than we know about ourselves. That's why Google knows if a person, a woman is pregnant before she does, why they can show us ads for things we've just thought about. Something has to be done to limit that. Then the second piece is you have to use antitrust law to create safe spaces for startups. And I think that's a place where there's a lot of examples in our past where we've done that successfully relative to AT&T to create the computer industry in order to create Silicon Valley and then later on to create the competitors in long distance. There are lots of examples of how this is done. And we're finally seeing our antitrust mechanism get started again after 
25 years of being inactive. Hey, Roger, finally, on the on the uncertainty that you suggest the president introduces into markets, I mean, the IPO market is still robust. We're getting multi-billion dollar M&A deals on Mondays. S&P is 2 percent from the high. Yeah. I mean, American business continues to chug along. Well, also, let's not forget, Carl, some of these things are sold, not bought, right? There have been massive marketing efforts to get these IPOs to work. And let's face it, they've worked really well, and some of the stocks continue to work really, really well. I mean, hope always springs eternal, right? And let's face it, we're in an ultra-low uh, in, in, uh, interest rate environment where there's a real opportunity maybe for rates to go lower. So the stock market's going to be the beneficiary of that. And, you know, at the same time, the M&A thing, that stuff is definitely sold. I mean, we see this morning the transaction between Salesforce and Tableau. And, I mean, what an amazing transaction for the Tableau shareholder. I mean, they were about to be in a business where their biggest competitors were going to be Amazon and Google. And all of a sudden they get bought out at a 50 percent premium. I mean, that is... I mean, we're breaking out the champagne on behalf of the Tableau <laughs> yeah, shareholder. That sure. was a great outcome.